Hey, welcome back to Fish Hunt Northwest. Told you it'd be a short break. We like to just get in and out and get you right back in the hot seat here. So, hey, you have a uh, fundraiser Q&A uh, meet and greet tomorrow night in Stanwood. What do you know about that? Yes, I'm going to be there. Oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's probably important. They're coming it's to see important. you, right? Yeah. 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 We're inviting everybody out to Stanwood. It's going to be at the, uh, I believe it's Republican headquarters up there. And um, hoping to see everybody out there. We're going to have a little silent auction and... I'll be there to meet everybody and give a little speech and tell everybody what I'm standing up for. Sure. A little Q&A and uh, come mm-hmm. meet Lauren Culp. And uh, where can they find that info? Culp for Governor on social media? Yeah, we have a website, okay. uh, culpforgovernor.com. Okay. And then we're on Facebook at Culp for Governor. Okay. Is there a way for people to donate to your campaign on that website? Or? Definitely. Okay. Yes. On the website, we need uh, financial help and we need volunteers. We can't do this alone. Okay. Um, I'm just a small town cop. I don't have <laughs> millions of dollars in the bank. Yep. So yeah, if they go to our uh, website, culpforgovernor.com. Uh, Perfect. There's a donation link on there. Perfect. All right, get on culpforgovernor.com and hit that donate button. Let's uh, let's start supporting this man as he moves uh, forward in his campaign. Speaking of which, as governor. You need to, you get to, you get the luxury of inheriting this, uh, this homeless epidemic, this uh, opioid epidemic. Um, let's back up and kind of break down how this thing evolved. First of all, certain cities, certain city councils, certain governors have pulled back uh, the ability for police to enforce, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. They've kind of taken a step back in laws. They've taken a step back in enforcing what used to be recognized as either a misdemeanor or an actual infraction of some level. And they, they're like, it's okay to have three ounces of heroin or it's okay to shoot up in the street or it's okay to defecate in the street or nobody cares. Uh, how did that happen and in, in how, how do we get that back to a a law enforcement level that is normal in society? Well, there are public nuisance laws on the books and have been for years. Right. It's a felony to possess heroin in this state. Currently. It doesn't matter how much it is. Mm-hmm. Yes, currently. Is that a state it, law? It's a state law. It's an okay. RCW. It's a felony to possess any amount of heroin. Right. Even just the, the tip of a pin yeah. amount is a felony okay. in this state. And what's happening in a lot of uh, counties around the Seattle area is the prosecutors will not prosecute for possession of heroin for any certain amount. It was three grams or less of heroin, and I was told yesterday that it's now up to seven grams. Three grams of heroin is enough for a two-week supply for a heroin user. That's ridiculous. That's that's a lot of heroin. Yeah. And if you reward bad behavior, you're going to get more bad behavior. Right. Okay, so... <clears throat> what would attract more people to an area that they are heroin users right. than decriminalizing heroin? Right. It's a magnet to mm-hmm. people all over the country. Right. We can come to Washington State. We can get food stamps. Mm-hmm. We can have our heroin and shoot it up anytime we want. We can use the streets as a toilet, and we can throw our litter everywhere, right. and nobody's going to do anything about it. Right. So w- what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. More and more people are coming from all across the country yep. to come to places like Seattle. And well, that's why we're seeing what we're seeing right now. If that was in a, in a different spectrum, I mean, if it was, it, it was like, well, we don't have the ability to prosecute all these folks. So if they want to walk into a store and load a shopping cart full of groceries and just wheel it out to their truck without paying... We're just going to look the other way because we don't have the time or the effort to prosecute these folks. Well, guess what? That's happening. That's basically, well, yeah, there's that too. It is right? happening. If you walk into a store yeah. in King County and you come out of that store with less than $50 worth of goods, yep. the police won't even run up a report. So police have and lost the ability the to police. It's fault. Right. right. It's their leadership's fault. Yeah. Yeah. So how is it that counties and or cities can overwrite state recognized law? And just continue to do that and think it's okay. They're, to me, it doesn't sound like they're policing for the betterment of the people. They're not, they're not taking action on the streets to make sure that the majority of uh, folks are safe and don't have to deal with this stuff. They're catering to a minority, which, be, which is a tremendous nuisance. And it's disturbing to see all that happening in front of our eyes. Mm-hmm. Our kids are being raised up around this stuff. And city councils and, and persons in government and law enforcement and everybody's just turned a blind eye to it like it's just going to go away. And you have city councils up north that are like, 
we're just going to build a bunch of housing and provide them places to live to get them off the streets. Is that the answer to this issue? A lot of people think it is. Yeah. Even some Republicans think that that's the answer. And it's not. We're just going to, we can build houses, tiny houses or big houses, whatever. We could just build a bunch of houses and get these people off the street. Right. Well, housing is not the problem. Right. Housing, for the vast majority, it's not the problem. It's the addiction and the mental health problem. Right. I have stood in a family home that had nice furniture. Um, everybody had nice clothes. There was lots of food. And I've stood in a home where the mom is hysterical. I'm trying to comfort the mom because their 20-year-old son is stiff as a board, half on and half off of his bed with a heroin needle in his arm. Right. That wasn't because he wasn't, didn't have housing, sure. didn't have food, didn't right. have clothing. Right. It's because he was an addict. Yep. And addicts are not going to stop heroin use because they want to one sure. day. Yeah. They're not going to wake up and go, uh, you know, I'm, I'm done not going right. to do this anymore. Right. They have to be forced into treatment. Yep. And that's what I've done in over in Ferry County in mm -hmm. Republic mm -hmm. is we've had strict enforcement and compassionate treatment at the same time. So the strict enforcement comes along when I arrest someone for a, a drug offense, either dealing or using, and they get taken to jail. Right. That's that's I'm the worst person in the world to that person right then. Sure. Right? Yep. They go to jail. They see the judge, and the judge forces them into treatment. Mm -hmm. Whether they're going to prison or they're going to jail or they're going to be released, they have to go through treatment, right? right. And if they go, don't go through treatment, then they end up spending more time in jail. A lot of them, most of them, I would say, go through the treatment because they realize, you know, that they're in jail and they haven't had their heroin for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. They're very, very sick. Oh, yeah. And they, some of them wake up and realize, you know, this is, I got to do something. So yep. they go along with the program. And I've had people come back from prison or treatment. And in a short time, they've got their kids back, which they lost mm -hmm. because they were a drug addict. Sure. They get a job, they buy a home, and they get married, mm -hmm. and they're, they're a family, healthy they a family, and have a yep. life, and they're part of society again. And they come back and thank me and tell me that I saved their life. So this, this has become a major epidemic. I mean, to the borderline, it's out of control with mm -hmm. the amount of, as you said, garbage and tent cities and tiny homes and the number of folks living on the streets um, in this time of year, particularly difficult with the, with the weather and the, and the conditions. Uh, did you ever see Eric Johnson's report on Como? Uh, I believe it was uh, Seattle's dying. dying. I felt he was spot on with his direction in taking, I believe it was McNeil Island that is at minimal capacity and could be, you know, built into this this uh, area of um, putting these folks into a program, putting them into, I mean, is that what you're talking about? Some type of large scale, like you're you're arrested, you go through the process, you have a choice. You either go to jail or you go to, go to a program and you put them in this lockdown, like I believe his comparable was Rhode Island. Um, and they had an extremely high success rate of these folks coming out of them. In other words, it's no longer acceptable just to do this behavior in the streets and pollute our cities and pollute our rivers because a lot of these encampments are along rivers. Mm -hmm. They tout the Green Deal. They talk about, uh, you know, the environment and all the things they're doing for clean water and stuff. And yet our rivers are surrounded by homeless encampments defecation into the waterways, garbage into the water, all this pollution going into the water under their watch and yet they're not doing anything about it. Is, is having a facility, you know, a large scale facility or also, you know, spread out throughout different counties and whatnot, but is that like the ultimate goal? And would you be able to find funding measures to ensure that that type of program could be inter introduced? The danger with just creating housing for these people? Well, I'm talking about programs and you're like, you're arrested, you're going to jail. It's a jail slash rehab process with counselors, doctors. It's a program. You're in lockdown. You're going to be here for three years on this program to get clean and sober and back on your feet before yeah, you're Yeah, that's ready. called prison. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And if we need more of them, we can build more of them. Okay. You know, not everyone's going to need to go to prison. Sure. You know, but the thing that, that people don't realize too is is taxpayers are funding this drug epidemic. Right. I've never arrested a drug dealer who didn't have multiple EBT cards. That's right. the food stamp cards. Yeah. 
that didn't have multiple people's uh, EBT cards in their wallet. They accept those as payment they for do. their for drug their dealing? Drugs. Yeah. Yes. People will get that filled at the beginning of the month, the three, four hundred, five, I don't know how much right. money. Right, yeah. Depending on how many kids they have. Sure. And then they'll take that to the drug dealer and they'll trade their card for drugs. Right. And he's on the bill. And then the drug store. dealer will take that card and go to the store, buy whatever he wants to buy, yep. and then sell it or keep it for his own use. Yeah. I've, I've never arrested a drug dealer. Um, without multiple cards. What are your thoughts about persons who are on assistance through the state? State assisted programs, EBT cards, housing, cell phones, um, and it goes it goes deeper than that, medical care and all those things. All those state supported uh, programs, uh, there's no there's no accountability to ensure that these people are not using drugs. They're well, not. Well, we can't do that. That'd be inhumane, right? <laughs> I mean, only working hard, playing hard Americans who have a job should, should be, be dr- subject to drug testing. Yes. Right? Yeah. For crying out loud. Yeah. That's the only thing I that mean, makes sense. Yeah. Right. We can't be inhumane to these people. Right. So, Absolutely, they should be drug tested. Right. Just like people who have a job and pay the taxes that they're living off of. Sure. You know, the, the food stamp program and welfare was set up to for a helping hand, to lift people up when they had hard times, sure. right? It wasn't set up to be a career mm-hmm. like right. it is now. It wasn't set up so people could use it to buy drugs. Or, or and, utilize it to raise your family. It's like, oh. Generation after generation. Yeah, after generation, generation is, after generation. It wasn't ever set up like right. that. Right. But that's what it's become. That's what happens when you have far left-leaning people in mm-hmm. charge of things. Right, right. Give them everything. The government is like the people need us <clears throat> to make it day-to-day. And we're going to give them all these programs to ensure we remind them how much they need us. And yet, and Ronald the, Reagan said, government is not the answer. Government is the problem. Right. And government just keeps growing bigger and bigger and bigger, this right. state. We've had over 12,500 days of Democratic leadership in this state. Yeah. And where are we now? Mm-hmm. We've got people crapping on the sidewalk, dirty yep. needles, tent cities everywhere. Yep. A fish and wildlife that is in shambles. Yep. People leave here to go fishing and hunting, yeah. not come here. Right. So that's where we are. Yeah. So do we want to continue that or do we want to give someone a chance who has a little bit of common sense? Right. Right. Yeah, they say the definition of insanity is repeating the same thing over exactly. and over, expecting a different outcome. <laughs> yeah. Well, we continue to vote Democratic every single year position of governor and we get the same thing over and over which is more regulation more waste more of the same garbage and higher yet taxes we can, higher, higher taxes higher regulation, right yeah. they never they never want to tighten the shoestrings and come up with a better budget they mm-hmm. just want to ask more money yeah. more money more yep. money more money and extend programs right. because yep. to them government is the answer right all you have to do is give us more tax more of your tax money and we'll make some more regulations in another department, and we will take care of the problem. Right. Yeah, that's not it. You have uh, you have three hard and fast bullet points or criteria that has to be met if a bill comes across your desk before you'll sign it. Exactly. I heard you mention it the other night at your uh, at yep. your speech. What yep. are those? I've got three tests for any bill that comes across my desk as as the next governor. Yeah. Number one, is it constitutional? Mm-hmm. Whatever bill they're proposing to become law, is it constitutional? Does right. the Constitution allow it? Because the Constitution is the rule book for the government. Yep. Right. right? Number two, will it help the citizens of Washington State? I mean, that this is Washington State government. Yeah. Right? And right. We're, we are the government... I'm talking as we, as of like I'm already the governor. But <laughs> That's our, fine. our state government. We are the government as the people. Yeah. We the people are the government. Right. Our government <laughs> is in place for the people. The people are not in place for the government. Yeah. And right now it's the other way around. It's, yeah. Right. It's backwards. Yeah. So will it help the citizens of Washington State? And number three, can we afford it? Mm-hmm. Right. Without raising taxes, can we afford it right, right now? If the first two pass, can we afford it? And if any of those three are not in, it doesn't fit, Mm -hmm. then I won't sign that bill. Uh, And that's my promise to the citizens of Washington State right now. So how do we going forward, especially for small business owners, entrepreneurs, the hardest thing has been government regulation, you know, corporate taxes for guys that want to start businesses. 
what what do you have planned in say the first year of your governorship to open it up to where business can basically blossom and people can look forward to starting businesses again? Mm -hmm. I started my own business in 1988, a um, couple years after I got out of the U.S. Army, and government didn't help me build that. Right. Right. Government right. hindered. They me claim with, that with fees and taxes, <laughs> and I started my construction business with a 1976 Datsun pickup truck that I bought from my grandpa for right. six hundred dollars <laughs> on payments. On payments, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Because I had to pay fees to the government to get my license. Right. So I set up with my grandpa on payments, and I had a homemade single axle wooden trailer, and I started doing concrete foundations around Olympia. And I had to make multiple trips from job site to job site with that truck and trailer to get my forms because they were so small. Um, but I built that up to multiple trucks, multiple employees, doing jobs big and small all around Puget Sound. And like I say all the time, government didn't help me do that. It hindered me. Every time I turned around, you know, there was a fee I had to pay. There were taxes I had to pay. There were government inspectors coming to my job that, that had never had a job of their own, didn't know what it was like to run their own business. And they came out there and acted like they owned me and owned me, my job. Sure. So government needs to get off of the backs. We need limited government like our founding fathers designed our country to be. And regulations are something the governor can take uh, care of right off the bat. Right. Excessive regulations hurt business. They strangle businesses. Mm -hmm. And that's something that from day one I can start eliminating. Right. Cut through the red tape. Mm -hmm. Give people a chance. Right. Right. Get government off of our back, out of our pocketbook. Yep. All right, fantastic. We, uh, we're going to jump out for a quick break. We, get, we come back. We're going to jump back into talking some more about a whole host of things relative to our uh, recovery of salmon and steelhead, uh, predation, uh, orca uh, survival plan. I got a whole host of things written down north of Falcon process. Um, you know, how do you as governor look upon this? This interactivity we have with our with our tribal co-managers, it's a pretty, at times, contentious relationship. And other times, folks who are with WDFW say, oh, it's harmonious, we're doing fine. But, you know, when you're sitting here waiting for decisions to be made, it doesn't always look like everything's so, so peachy, you know. So um, there's a lot of issues going on there. Um, Tibet for 12,500 days. The state's been under uh, democratic rule, <clears throat> and the tribes tend to lean towards the Democrats. There's a lot of, there's a lot of pocket lining going on with, with campaign contributions, you know, from the tribes, the casino money, the, uh, the bingo halls, um, there's, that's a lot of money. And obviously in this state, it's been proven that money gets things done. So we're just going to kind of walk down that road and see where you're at as far as some of these, uh, very apparent issues that go on amongst our fishing and hunting and and, and an opportunity and co-management. So we'll jump into all that when we come back from this break right here on FHN.